well, I would start by saying I'm a pain in the ass, and I think I've always been. Um, I'm usually doing a couple things at a time. I'm always trying to figure out, you know, what can be done. How do I make something faster, better, smoother? I don't like hearing no, uh, and a uh, bit of an authority complex. I just never, just never like to hear no. And uh, uh, whenever someone told me I couldn't do something, I always really wanted to do it. So uh, I don't know, maybe it's my Polish Italian roots. I actually did very, very well in the Air Force. Um, I, had, I understand chain of command and I can respect that, but at the same time I have respect for my own opinions and I think for myself. So uh, during the time that I was in the military, we had a lot of uh, real world business to do and uh, I was able to get the job done when, when it needed to be done. Um, I would say, and, and he would, be amazed if I actually gave him credit, but my, my dad, um, pr he pretty much instilled a, a pretty tough work ethic on me at a very young age, you know, always, literally since I was four or five years old, you know, doing chores, cutting the grass, doing laundry, like all this type of stuff that like a five-year-old typically doesn't do. But anyway, has, I've always worked at a very young age, you know, all my extracurriculars usually revolved around work as opposed to like doing sports or things of that nature. Um, and I always had a lot of pride in the work because I think, you know, there were several people who have, no matter who I'm working for, I always want to make sure that they're satisfied. Even if it's a very mundane job, like when I would work at a grocery store at a retirement home or whatever the case might be when I was younger, uh, those things kind of translated, uh, as an adult, um, along the way. Also, I really got involved with music and that shifted my life in a lot of different ways. You know, when I went to college, I focused on, on audio production or telecommunications, but with a, you know, focus on audio and realized very early on that that was a poor choice to make as far as a career was concerned. I realized I was in this situation, but I still had this passion for music. I kind of took it as more of a hobby and ended up taking jobs I didn't really care about so much, um, like selling insurance, um, <laughs> you know, things like that, where I, I could still have the flexibility to pursue music. And long story short, because of my passion for music and the ability to kind of network and build those relationships, not only locally in Cleveland, let's say, but around the world, um, because the music side actually did take off uh, to some degree. I was mildly relevant at one point. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I was able to actually take those relationships with the people that I built, you know, across, you know, across the country, overseas, what have you, and turn those into more professional relationships. So, again, kind of coming back to always wanting to do well, no matter who I'm working for or working with, taking that mentality, even with music, uh, I think was quite evident to the people that I was, you know, performing for, working with, whatever, and they knew I wasn't a, a scumbag. <laughs> And, um, you know, we just built our relationships that way. You know, as far as disruption is concerned, you know, is it is it disruptive to take very uh, old, old industries that are very set in their ways and plug them into concepts and ideas that are coming from, you know, either the entertainment industry or, or some other industry that they would never be open to and, and be able to push that? Um, you know, and, and as far as the work is concerned, you know, a lot of the work that we're proud of, it, it isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be from the, the big clients that, you know, that we've worked for. You know, a lot of times the open-mindedness of the smaller companies that we've worked with um, just turn out a better product. The way that we even started the company without any investments, without any loans, without any real business plan, and being able to grow that company every year, literally, you know, was never in the red. Um, to grow that company every year um, and to ultimately sell it in one of the worst economies in history um, and do this in such a way that is so atypical. You know, most people when they start a company, they have all of those things in line already. You know, we were able to take this one man to two man shop to five man shop to different markets to ultimately being acquired in, in a way that you typically don't hear people. Definitely hearing. not. Our, in our business, they're usually... Uh, everyone was so fat for so long. And so we took this super lean approach and we were able to turn out more work than the big agencies who would then call us to get work done that they couldn't get done 
you know, which yeah, that that always made us laugh. You have all these people, you have all this money, you have this huge budget to work with, but yet you can't deliver the projects that we are able to deliver in a third of the time. Right, and so I would say, you know, as far as being disruptors are concerned, we kind of changed the game as far as what those expectations are on deliverables. You know, what someone may quote six months to deliver, we can do in one month. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the same thing every day, you should be worried because somebody else is passing you by. Um, you know, part of my motivation is just I didn't want to be one dimensional. I know people aren't one dimensional and their career shouldn't be either. And so when we help a client, we approach it that way. I think the lesson that I take away that's the, at the top of my mind is that people are capable of more than they're qualified to do. Um, and you don't, need, you don't need to ask permission from anyone to do something yet. You just do it. We had started the company in Cleveland and then, uh, you know, we had a certain client base and we're under the impression that we have a pretty good way to feel people out. You know, you, upon your first meeting, whether or not they're going to buy, whether or not, you know, they're worth following up on, things of that nature. But um, when I moved to Chicago uh, about two and a half years ago, I quickly realized that every market is different and you need to approach these individuals differently and you can't underestimate what any simple encounter might be. You know, I've, I've met people, let's just say out at the bar or whatever, and, you know, guys covered in tattoos, you know, and you're just like kind of shooting the shit with them and, you know, you come to realize this guy's worth several million dollars. You have no idea who you're talking to. So you can't make these assumptions on people based on their appearance. And I think that, you know, professionalism aside, I mean, that's, that's a standard, I think, overall, your professional demeanor. But the, the judging this book by its cover kind of thing, as cliche as it is, you definitely can't do it when it comes to, you know, trying to find new clients, new partners. People can offer you things that you would never imagine they can offer you. And to give people like that mutual respect and don't just assume because they are covered in tattoos or because they're, you know, not necessarily dressed well or whatever, that they can't bring something to the table. So I try to put value in pretty much every relationship I have and feel that it's always going to come back around. You're, something's going to come of it. If you don't know something, learn it. You know, teach yourself and, and get other people to help you. And, and when, when you're done, help them. Yes. And, and don't be afraid. I think that this is a, a huge problem with people is that at business owners, they think they know everything and they don't. And they need to come to the conclusion that, you know what, there's someone better suited than myself that can do this job. So if, if you can't do it, you know, you can try and, and you should try to do it on your own. But, you know, you need to realize sooner than later that, you know, if you're not capable of doing it, there's no shame in, in hiring that, that job out to somebody else. So many people I think that we encounter, there's a lot of pride when you're a business owner. And people have a hard time swallowing that pride and, and saying, all right, you know what, I'm, I'm wrong. I need to find a way to actually make this right. You know, I hear a lot of fear out there now, especially since, uh, I don't know, it just seems to be the, the common theme since 2006 or hey, maybe, maybe even earlier that like, oh, now's not a good time. Now's not a good time. You know, no one's going to get any younger. You might as well get out there and, and, and get going. Because uh, you know you can always make up any money, but you can never make back time. You know, Jude and I deal with this a lot because we're working with companies on the inside, and we just see how terribly they execute their own projects. You know, there's always a uh, there's always this hesitation. Everybody wants to be conservative. Everybody wants to throw an opinion in, but they don't really have maybe the creative uh, passion or they're not as passionate about their views, and you end up with a watered-down product. So, for example, where, where Jude and I, during our creative process, we will fight it out. You know, we'll have our, our, our debates on you know, what we think is the right direction. A lot of companies, because of their hierarchies, they don't, they don't really do that. Um, it's usually very passive, and then, again, the, the product ends up being watered-down, late, yeah, late, and then it's, it's nothing, to, nothing of note where the, some of the smaller companies that we work with, the startup companies, you know, they're, they're like us, right? They're smaller shops and they just, they don't have a traditional structure yet. They don't have the, you know, the, uh, the older guy telling him, 
how they need to think. And so they just go ahead and do, and companies like Google and Facebook, they buy those guys. They buy those guys, they leave them in place, and then they just feed them work because they know that that works. And I think that the bigger companies should take note of that. I think that more and more people are going to require the freedom to work on their own projects while they're under the employment of somebody else. So for example, when we had our employees, we would always encourage them to take on their own side jobs and to you know do their freelance, what have you. We always looked at it as continuing education, so to speak. So you, know, you can go work on a project that's completely not relevant to what we're hiring you for. And, and as a result, your skill set's going to get better. You're going to come back to the table with you know, a, a new concept, a new skill, you know, all of these things that will benefit us in the long run. And I think that employers as a whole need to kind of let go of those clutches sometimes. You know, employers have this grand vision you know, that, oh, you know, I, I want to do X, Y, Z. But they need to understand that you know, they put all this time and energy into these employees that are actually going to execute that vision for them. And in order to keep them happy and keep them engaged in those projects, you also need to let them go and do their other projects on the side and not hold them so tight to what it is they're doing for you. Because like to Dave's point, you're going to get stagnant and you will lose um, that creativity, that passion and overall happiness at, you know, at your job. So, and also that self-motivation, you don't want to have an employee that just gets in the rut of being told what to do all the time. Mm -hmm. So when they're out there doing things for themselves, they are building, they have that initiative and it's education that you don't have to teach them. It's projects that you didn't have to bring in. Now more than ever before, I think the world has shrunk to a size where things can, um, that everything affects everything else. And, it, and a small example is the tsunami in Japan. The, the fallout from that hit California and it even hit some, some islands um, that I had visited this year. You know, it was very remote and they're showing me things that washed up from Japan and it was, it was, to me, it was a very striking example of how small the world really is. That things that happen so far away can still wash up. Um, and, and I think to, to bring that back around, you know, the way we think, the way we live, and the way that it affects everyone else is, is definitely something that we should, we should think more about. Qualifications aren't necessarily based on experience. There are a lot of young, talented kids out there that are doing amazing things. I mean, they've been brought up with these machines that, you know, I could have only dream of, <laughs> I could have only dreamt of, you know, 10, 20 years ago. You know, and now that there's 14-year-old, 15-year-old, you know, 18-year-old kids that are just doing mind-blowing work and whether that's you know music design development coding you know all these tools are at their fingertips and I think that people are in this kind of old school mentality that that basically says all right we don't want to hire you unless you've already put in these 15 years and I understand that from a professional point of view you know you, you need to be able to interact with people that's a whole other side of it but the skill set alone that's coming out these days it blows our mind.